suggest we get started. 42 participants. That's great. So once again, a very warm welcome to our conference, Sustainable Batteries for Electric Vehicles, European Due Diligence Legislation and EU Trade Policy. This uh, online conference is organized by the Rosa Luxembourg Brussels, and uh, we are an international foundation. My name is Manuela Kropp. I uh, will be the host of today's conference. I also uh, helped organizing it. Uh, first of all, a few housekeeping uh, bits of information. We will have our conference until 2.30. First of all, we will have a few um, panelists. We have contributions from Brussels, from Indonesia, from Argentina. And um, then we will be able to have a discussion. You could either post a star in the chat, and then we will we'll pass the floor to you, or you can simply ask your question in the chat, and we will take it up. Uh, feel free also to chat among yourself. You can exchange interesting links and use the chat for that. So really, the chat is available for everyone to really create and facilitate an exchange. That's the idea of this conference. Uh, one important information, we will record the uh, contributions, the presentations, but afterwards, uh, during the discussion, we will stop recording so you can speak freely. So what's the background for today's conference? Why did we meet here today? Of course, it's about climate change, fighting climate change. Of course, we're dealing with the pandemic and um, people are focusing on economic recovery. But still, uh, climate change is always an important topic. There is a midterm review or report on of the UNFCC. Um, came out in February and it showed that those who signed um, the agreement on reducing climate change will not achieve the 2% limit, uh, not to mention the 1.5%. Yes. So uh, that's nothing new. Uh, it was also confirmed that the uh, transport sector is the only sector where emissions are still rising and that's a huge problem and that's why we have to address this topic uh, the transport sector in particular and especially the individualized uh, vehicle transport so personal car use the european commission has adopted the green deal uh, last year and is also trying to achieve a paradigm shift, um, a more ecological economy, and that's also a huge aspect for us because they really um, focus on electric cars as something very ecological, but that's not always the case. Um, for example, in European legislation, electric vehicles are considered to be emission free and they're not and um, because, uh, for example, they uh, produce fine particles, etc. And so there are other kinds of emissions. And of course, there are other kinds of CO2 emissions. We have to look at the uh, production situation, for example, um, and um, of course, especially the raw material, which comes from uh, Latin America and from um, uh, Indonesia mainly. The European Union has set its goal to achieve 30 million electric vehicles by 2030, and the International Energy Agency assumes that we will have 140 electric vehicles worldwide until that year. So there is an, a rise in the popularity of electric vehicles, and um, in the European Union, some battery production plans are, plants are planned. A lot of European countries have also announced that this is the end of the com combustion engine era. So that means demand in uh, lithium 
will increase and nickel will increase and in terms of other materials as well um, in the European Union. It is assumed that we will have a 60 times higher demand of uh, lithium compared to today. So that's a huge number. And of course, we're looking at a global supply chain, a global network in production. And that is why we are delighted to be able to welcome our presenters here from all over the world. We mm, very uh, we welcome Melissa Argento from Argentina. We welcome Isidianto and Pius uh, from uh, Indonesia. And we will also be able to hear Helmut Scholz, who is a member of the European Parliament here in Brussels. That will allow us to look at the different perspectives here because uh, it's very important that when we have a proposal uh, for a law for Europe from the European Commission, and this has to be a just and fair law when it comes to production uh, chains, uh, supply chains. It has to consider the ecological impact. It has to consider all the different components of the um, production chains. We need to make sure that climate protection isn't undermined. We need to make sure that the needs of local communities are taken into consideration. For example, these um, in Argentina, in Bolivia, Chile, but also in Indonesia, for example. How can we take their situation into consideration to make production, well, more human friendly? so to speak. And how can we make sure that the global south is less dependent on production capacities in the global north? So how can we act there in the global south to um, create production facilities that are ecological, that are environmentally friendly? Um, the state of Indonesia, for example, started some initiatives in that respect. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. How can we process the material where it is mined? Um, but now we will first of all hear Helmut Scholz. He has been a member of the European Parliament since 2009. He's a member of the left group and he's a trade expert of uh, the left uh, party group. Uh, he will unfortunately not be until the so we will maybe um, give you an opportunity to answer um, directly after his presentation. He will uh, focus on the supply chain and also the Mercosur agreement and the problems that come along with it. He will comment on the European trade policy in general and also on the reform of the WTO. So that's a lot and it's basically impossible to um, deal with all that within uh, 10 minutes, but we'll give it a try anyway. We'll have to all keep it short because we're online and we all have to look at a screen and stay focused. Helmut, you have the floor. Thank you, Manuela. Hello from Brussels uh, to everyone here who have uh, joined us here for this very interesting event. I think it's a great opportunity to uh, really come together across continents and have an exchange on this important topic. And I think others from other continents uh, should have probably <laughs> joined us as well, because, um, well, it will be an important topic in the future. And hopefully this will only be the start. It will be kind of a kickoff meeting for further meetings and exchanges. Well, there's a lack of sustainability in the supply chain um, for batteries, that's for sure. And in connection with that, we have an increase in demand, not just in industrialized countries, but basically in all countries around the world, in all those at least who are active in international or economic uh, trade and exchange. And this increased demand is not a coincidence. It's um, due to the fact that there is a lot of media attention and a lot of um, attention of civil society on electric vehicles and electric uh, transport, for example. That has to do with our climate emergency situation, of course. Uh, so we focus a lot more on um, ecological aspects, on the environment when uh, we talk about production of goods. There was a study, Limits of Growth, which was published in 1972, so already 50 years ago, by the Club of Rome. And 
already in that study, we can see that uh, the debate is necessary and had uh, started a long a time ago. So there is a huge demand, but what does it mean uh, for Argentina or Indonesia? What does it mean if um, the water level will increase by three or um, five or 50 centimeters? Um, we are all witnessing global warming and what that means for the Arctic, for example. I also saw pictures um, taken by the NASA, uh, which showed that potentially even the coastlines of my home country, Germany, are threatened. So we really need an enormous effort to minimize this climate disaster while we are still able to do so. And uh, large multinational enterprises, car producers, uh, the automotive industry have denied climate change for the last 50 years. And as a result, our efforts today have to be even bigger. There's a capitalist logic um, behind the uh, current investment uh, or the commitment to fighting climate change because climate change will come at a cost. For example, losses when it comes to urban or agricultural infrastructure make a huge impact. And that is why um, banks or um, insurances also change their thinking now. Of course, um, they are still driven by capitalism. But at least that means that they are reconsidering uh, financing uh, climate threatening activities. We have a green deal um, proposed by the EU or adopted by the EU. Um, we also have a similar initiative in China, in the US, in South Africa, which means that um, a Ecological transformation is meant to be implemented without really changing our way of consumption, for example. How is that supposed to work is uh, what I would like to know, because we are still depleting resources and raw materials with a kind of colonial approach. And um, the industrialized nations still demand access to raw materials in other parts of the world. The EU, China, US, South Korea are really in a race and competition when it comes to that kind of access. And at the moment, um, the EU Commission is um, taking the government of Indonesia to trial in the framework of the WTO because uh, they stopped uh, raw material exports, um, exports of ore. Um, a few years ago because they wanted um, these materials to stay in Indonesia to be able to process them there and to promote the processing industry in Indonesia. So people have become aware that the country, as a country such as Indonesia, uh, will not um, play a role um, if they only are a supplier of raw materials. So I think it's legitimate if a country like Indonesia makes it harder to export raw materials from their country. And that is an approach that is followed in other countries in Latin America and Africa as well. And European negotiators so far have always said there should not be any export duties when it comes to these materials. And at the moment, negotiations are taking place between the EU and Chile. And one major topic there is, once again, the access to lithium resources. How can that access be granted and organized? Here, the European Commission wants to achieve collaboration, even though the Constitutional Assembly in Chile uh, doesn't uh, want to do so. So the Commission really wants to uh, ratify the Mercosur agreement uh, to finalize it um, as uh, far as possible in order to uh, continue their neoliberal approach um, and to make sure that the European importers and exporters will have um, a better position. And their um, argument is uh, Chinese competition. They say we can't afford to wait for democratic processes to end because the Chinese will overtake us and they will uh, already receive their access. 
And that's one of the central problems here. In many countries of the European Union, there are some uh, national laws that are being discussed or even have been adopted. Um, and on the European Union, uh, hopefully, um, there will be a different approach in the future as well. Um, so we are waiting on a um, due diligence legislation um, from a European level, because that could help us to mitigate the problems um, connected to that supply chain because then we would be able to really focus on the social and access related aspects of the supply chain. So we need that kind of due diligence legislation. We need an initiative on the European level so that we make sure that we don't just focus on trade interests or our own profit or the corporate profit but that we also take other aspects into account, the environment, creation of jobs, human rights, and so on. They should have an equal part in a new legislation on EU level and also on WTO level. I think uh, we are kind of uh, witnessing a gold digging era here uh, when it comes to these raw materials. Um, for example, um, regarding the components uh, for wind parks. Manuela also mentioned EU, um, the EU-Mercosur agreement, which is certainly not uh, helping the uh, supplying countries because the EU will have easier access to Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay potentially. And that's basically the only benefit of that agreement. And if there are no changes in the framework conditions for such an agreement or within which the agreement uh, will be implemented, um, so if there is no sustainability chapter in such an agreement, uh, we uh, can see what happens. Colombia is an example. There was a free trade agreement with the EU and that means that there is now a complete depletion of um, the or mines there, which obviously uh, goes to the detriment of the environment, of human rights and of social aspects. So we really need to rethink the situation drastically when we want to achieve the 17 sustainability goals of the European Union, because after all, um, the European governments have adopted these goals and they um, pledge to achieve them by 2030. That kind of rethinking means that the Europeans, however, cannot just achieve their goals um, to the burden of other nations. We need to make sure that everyone collaborates uh, in that step and everyone benefits from this uh, transition. It shows us that we are really living in a situation of global dependency here. Uh, we, are, mm, we will only be able to move on to move forward if we integrate and include everyone. The EU makes up uh, for 5% uh, world's population and we are now going uh, through a pandemic. Um, uh, we are making a lot of efforts to limit the consequences of that pandemic. And that shows us uh, yet again how important it is to think globally and to get everyone, get every country on board. And in some respect, we have found a common answer when it comes to fighting the pandemic. And hopefully that will teach us something when it comes to fighting the environmental and social aspects of um, um, raw material mining. I'm looking forward to this conference and I hope to learn something from it. I'm uh, very much looking forward to hear about the trade union situation in Indonesia. I would like to hear how you um, would like um, nickel mining 
organized so that you can participate in it as well. I would like to know how Indonesia is dealing with the financial crisis and how within that financial crisis um, the country could find solutions uh, where the population could participate in um, the profits from mining and how this kind of mining uh, could take ecological aspects into consideration. Another question would be whether there are possibilities uh, for cooperating with uh, Europe when it comes to renaturalizing uh, coal mines, uh, where we have an experience in Europe. So could we help there? Could we provide some support um, in restructuring former mining areas? Those are all the topics that I'm very curious to hear more about. And uh, two final remarks, if I may. I think we all agree that um, around the world are poor and have a lot of unmet needs. And the United Nations say that we have to overcome this poverty, that um, we have to have access to uh, dignified life, to medical care, etc. So. If we talk about a better standard of living, we can't. it can't be the Europeans only who take the decision. We are a, a totally different society. We are oversaturated, but the majority of the population worldwide has a lot of needs that are not met, and we have to really um, create that kind of inclusive growth or potentially degrowth in order to remedy that situation. And secondly, if we want to electrify the entire planet, I personally am of the opinion that that's not possible, at least not on the basis of the um, resources right now. So um, we have to reconsider e-mobility. What does it mean uh, when it comes to mining, when it comes to raw materials and the use of batteries? How can we adapt that um, to a future situation where we have less resources available? And that brings me to the question whether lithium and the mining of other ores or metal um, makes it available to uh, find new energy resources. And we have very uh, critical debates in Germany um, about nuclear power, for example, or also in the European Parliament, we said we don't want nuclear energy, which means in Germany, for example, nuclear power is not meant to be um, an energy provider for our population. So we need to use regenerative energy, renewable energy, but we need to take a closer look at yeah. green hydrogen is another thing that is uh, constantly brought up in the moment. And I think that will be a useful approach um, to fight ag against global warming, new energy from um, Deserts, uh, solar cells and deserts um, might be of help as well, could even reduce the poverty in the Sahel zone, for example. And uh, when looking at the circular economy, for example, we could imagine Indonesia using green hydrogen from Australia, for example. So there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of possibilities, and we need to use them. And new partnerships uh, in the debate of ecological and environmental uh, needs and also social needs um, will have to be taken into account in the future. And that is why I would like to thank Osa Luxemburg Stiftung once again to have organized this meeting because this uh, can be a first step um, to start this and I'm very grateful for it because we in the European Parliament. Thank you, for mentioning the term of inclusive growth and um, building a bridge to um, the participatory aspect, local communities, and then also um, creating a link between um, energy. Ich würde aber vorschlagen dass äh, wir das ein bisschen zurückstellen ähm, für den Diskussionszeit. She works at the University of Buenos Aires, um, Argentina. And uh, Argentina, um, Chile, and Bolivia are the main countries providing 
lithium for lithium ion batteries. And Melissa has been busy for years um, in terms of uh, lithium extraction, strategic um, uh, arguments between uh, global powers and uh, the framework of the uh, energy turnaround. And Melissa is going to talk about um, the context in Argentina, uh, Chile, and Bolivia. Also, uh, she's going to mention the role of German capital there on how transnational structures have to be changed um, on the spot and what the local aspects of um, are of um, changing over to battery electric uh, cars. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to participate in this uh, interesting panel with colleagues from all over the world. More specifically, I would like to thank uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and obviously Rosa, who has helped me. I would like to underline that uh, when we talk about lithium mining, we are talking about the salt spaces in the northwest uh, of Argentina and the north of Chile. This territory called the Lithium Triangle, it's a region uh, where live several communities and populations uh, who live from tourism, uh, cattle, and recently from mining. But uh, they were um, selling uh, salt uh, from uh, for decades. Uh, a set of uh, these populations and communities are, have been denouncing uh, the environment act due to the lack of sustainability of lithium mining we are talking about uh, uh, rights breach uh, the no lack of information and consultation uh, um, also drought or the risk of drought due to the usage of water in the mining They can use uh, 900,000 liters uh, um, per um, salt water and uh, also sweet water. Amongst the negative impacts or the risks, uh, we can uh, talk about hydric stress. In these uh, salt areas, it's a very concrete uh, risk and many of them are regulating uh, the level of water in the region. To answer the question, my team, uh, Grupo de Estudio Geopolitica en Bienes Comunes, so we've been analyzing for the last 10 years uh, lithium, and we can say uh, that the pressure of this uh, ore for the automation uh, market, uh, together with uh, the demand uh, from microelectronic components, uh, has led uh, to a fever for lithium, uh, which has been completely deregulated. As we know, for 2021, the demand of lithium will increase 41 times uh, if uh, the uh, provisions uh, are right. Obviously, the European Union and other countries uh, will fight uh, for the access uh, to the ore and also the control of patents and knowledge um, related to the extraction but also to the market. In Argentina, the legislation allows uh, its exportation without almost ad added value. It leaves at 3% of uh, um, irrigations to the uh, population. There's a lot of costs related to that, and the national state, uh, um, Argentina, uh, has very little tools for monitoring and regulating the activity 
because the resources and the competences are from the provinces. Uh, there is a very strong pressure from the international powers uh, to guarantee access uh, to this primary ore. And therefore, there is an extraction and pressure, and we can see it uh, with the increase of projects that we've seen in the salt flats and salt marshes in the last five or seven years. In Argentina, even if there are only two active extraction projects of lithium uh, um, in uh, salt flats or Chari and uh, in the salt marshes of Hombre Muerto, the majority of the salt marshes in the region have been um, um, limited. Uh, with, there are different phases, obviously. And uh, we can see that there are uh, mining people, automate ocean companies uh, from Australia, Canada, Chinese, uh, um, French. Uh, and this means uh, that because of the launch of these projects, we would multiply exponentially the extraction of this or um, the usage of water and the uh, impacts are not duly studied. Uh, there aren't any uh, whole studies of uh, uh, the um, waters uh, and the aquifer basin. There are different levels and the cycles are very slow. And at the same time and due to the height and it, it's a very um, delicate ecosystem. Other environmental impacts uh, are due to the waste generation the, that are next to, to the salt marshes uh, and the cost uh, of recycling uh, um, and also the cost of the mine in itself. Uh, And this is similar to other mining activities and together with the information uh, from several studies uh, to produce 25,000 tons of carbon lithium, uh, we would use 481,000 hectares. Uh, and uh, there are mountains of small particles that are um, in the salt marshes, and that has an impact in the cattle, but there are no studies. Uh, there would be 72 million uh, um, square meters of uh, uh, these uh, this waste. So there are real impacts uh, due to this lithium extract, and we have to make the difference uh, with the environmental impact, even though it's related. The, firstly, the risks of a drought of uh, uh, the rivers uh, and uh, the supply of water to the population. And uh, um, also there are movements uh, in the basins uh, and this possibility has been included in several scientific reports. Uh, the special um, speaker for the indigenous people, and this will make disappear some uh, uh, populations from some areas, uh, and will put at risk some uh, uh, biodiversity. So the use of water for the lithium mining is in competition uh, with uh, uh, the population living there. Many of these communities uh, say uh, water is more important than lithium, uh, and this to confront uh, uh, the uh, companies uh, who are promoting uh, uh, the substitution of uh, fossil automotion by electric automotion. But these agendas and agreements uh, do not question the asymmetric uh, logics and unequal logics that are behind uh, these resources of uh, lithium and others. Uh, and um, the consumption logics are not uh, uh, studied with the role of the individual transport, for example. 
So the Latin American territory uh, suffer from the, this extraction. The processing takes place uh, outside. Uh, um, it leaves uh, uh, the water basins empty. And this and those who promote the local development and uh, economic uh, profits for the population um, have to face uh, um, fragmentation in the population and there is a there are conflicts because we talk about populations that are um, far away from the uh, big cities with a scarcity in services and uh, uh, social rights so, so there is quite a division before mining so these are some of the social environmental uh, impacts uh, due to the, the lithium extract. Uh, and this makes us see, makes us think that the transformation in the lithium mining should be multiple. We have to guarantee uh, that uh, the local legislation is respected, reinforce uh, such legislation uh, to implement uh, the um, consultation, the indigenous rights uh, that is included in international conventions, as we know to radically transform the legislation, the mining lithium legislation that goes against the population. And we need more autonomy uh, from the uh, corporation interests in the provinces. We have to implement uh, autonomous uh, territorial uh, processes uh, uh, which are not conditioned by the need of employment. Uh, we need also to implement an, an international policy uh, encouraging the creation of value in the origin country. Also to take advantage of the solid uh, research um, in Argentina the researches that, that have been carried out by several teams. And obviously, to include more the local communities, uh, what we observe regarding uh, the Mercosur agreement, uh, the impact of this uh, trade agreement uh, in the Argentinian mining industry will put more pressure in this mining industry. Uh, there will be a lower degree of purity in the uh, battery or lithium in solution. And this is another way of going down in the value chain um, to deepen in the uh, de uh, industrialization process, the importation of uh, um, cars. Um, and we see the that the the triangle of lithium, the area of the triangle of lithium, will be more polluted. Now, to conclude, uh, the trade policies that we need to support in the fight against climate change. Uh, what Helmut has said previously was extremely interesting. I think that uh, the pandemic allows us uh, to study the relocalization processes for the value chain. This means uh, a deconcentration of the and the denial is in the business area and in the mining and the rearticulation of the uh, production chains that have been disintegrated due to the neoliberalism progress. I'm I'm concluding. Weil wir heute nicht so viel Zeit haben. Kannst du noch deinen Abschlusssatz sagen? Und dann haben wir ja noch Zeit zum Diskutieren. Exactos. Sí, sí. Yes, yes. Just, uh, no problem. Say your last sentence, and then we have time. Yes. Yes, Manuela, thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you very much for understanding. And thank you for mentioning uh, local production conditions and also the effects on uh, local communities and that uh, we need a local uh, value creation and local the added value. And now uh, let's uh, continue with another very important uh, region, Indonesia. Also in the context of lithium-ion batteries, we have two speakers from Indonesia. We'll start with uh, Pius Ginting. Pius uh, works for AEER, an organization uh, called Ecological Action and People Innovation. He is a co-author with two publications that the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation has published on the topic of nickel uh, mining and battery production in Indonesia. I have already uh, posted the link to that publication in the chat. And uh, he's going to talk about um, extraction conditions um, in the country and we'll talk about uh, ways to improve. And he's got a presentation. Mm, Piers, please, you have the floor. Terima kasih, Manuela. Dan terima kasih kepada Losa Lusembet yang telah membantu. Everyone, thank you, everyone. Also, thank you to all the speakers who has helped AEER in conducting this study of the impact of nickel in Indonesia. And we have also produced a documentary about the communities that have been impacted by the nickel mining in Indonesia. It was interesting to hear about, to hear the presentation from Helmut stating that Indonesia has the right to develop its own, its industry. Indonesia is not just the supplier of raw materials. This is good because this will make Indonesia has the opportunity to increase its industrial capacity for batteries. But this is not enough. There needs to be improvements. Although the industry will be located in Indonesia, there will be impacts that will be created, be it environmental or social, which I will explain in my presentation. Can I please go into my presentation to page two? Indonesia is nickel center where 25% of the global reserve is located in Indonesia, most specifically in the Eastern region of Indonesia. We can see the graph on the top right-hand corner. Indonesia is number one, followed by Australia. If the world exploits nickel for batteries, then the impact for Indonesia would be quite significant. And nickel in Indonesia is centralized in three locations. And they are in Sulawesi, in Halmahera, and another one in Obi Island. And these are located in the Eastern region of Indonesia. And if you want to produce batteries, it will create a product called tailing. Tailing slurry that dumps waste into the sea. And this is the Coral Triangle Initiative region with the highest biodiversity, marine biodiversity in the world in Morowali, Obi, and Weda in Halmahera. This is where the nickel mining are located in Indonesia and where the tailings 
may cause harm to the environment. So there are three issues that we see here. The first one is tailing management and the use of coal for nickel factories and ecological disturbance on the fishermen in Morowali, Obi, and Weda. And this is one of the fishermen in Obi that we showed in our documentary. His name is Mr. Amir with a very simple boat, as you can see on the right. He needs to go further to find fish because in his region, in Morowali, the region has been impacted by nickel waste. And Mr. Amir used to be nomadic fisherman. But since the 1990s, he was advised by the government to stay in one place so that the children and his children could get some education and health services. But since the 1990s, after he decided to stay in Morowali, the village has now become the largest nickel processing plant in Indonesia. And it has impacted, impacted their lives especially when the tailings are piped into the sea around them. And this is the Morowali Industrial Park. And you can see the Kurisa and Fatuhia villages on the right. And you can see that the seas in Indonesia is usually very clear. But now you can see that it's no longer blue. And will, it will get worse once people t pipe the tailings into the sea. And the fishermen in Kurisa and Batufia have experienced a decline in the environment since the establishment of the nickel industry within their area. And this is another region in Weda in Halmahera Island. They also have a nickel factory in nickel for this region used to be a protected forest. So if the nickel production, the global nickel production will be centralized in Indonesia, and if there are no changes in the consumption, then the protected forest in the weather region will be depleted because they will be mined. And this will cause the indigenous people, the people who, who are still living a nomadic life, such as the Nobelo tribe that still lives in the forest, not this forest, but other forests, but they will be threatened by the nickel mining industry. And this is the lives in Weda. You can see the fishermen on the left. It's a husband and wife team, and they're rowing their simple boat, a very small boat to find fish and at the in the background you can see the chimneys from the coal factory coal mining uh, plant and this is from this is a uh, Guma village and people live from agriculture and also from the sea and 
picture in the bottom, you can see it's their bottom. It's a very small boat. And if their seas are polluted because of the tailing, then their economy and their lives uh, will decline. And the second, the use of coal for power plant, both in Morowali, where there will be a 2,400 megawatt power plant that will be built. And the graph on the top right hand corner is based on the research that we did. And you can see that uh, issues on breathing have increased since 2018. And the most and because of the because of the quality of the air and the pollution, there are more and more respiratory diseases. And in the bottom is in Halmahera. Respiratory illness have also increased significantly since 2019. What we can improve is to advocate the do not dispose the tailings into the sea so that the seas will be protected. And if they dump their waste on land, then it can be controlled. It cannot be controlled because of lack of spaces. So the waste should be returned to the mine holes, and that's called and the second thing that we can do is to not use coal-fired power plant for the factories, but to use renewable energies. We read on the, in the news that one company from China have said that they would like to develop solar energy and wind energy in Morowali. And we hope that this can happen so that the pol pollution could be reduced and would provide greater benefits for the people in the surrounding areas. And the third one is protection of the quality of life for the fishermen in Morowali and to make sure that their lives, livelihood will not decrease because those who can work at the young, those who are aged 20, in their 20s, in their 30s, but once you reach 50s or 60s, they will not be accepted at the nickel industry. So they work as fishermen or farmers, but the problem, and but this means that the sea and the land needs to be of good quality so that they can continue their lives. And that is my presentation, and we will continue more in the discussion. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Pius, and also thank you very much for sticking to the time. Uh, it was very interesting to hear how the local production uh, conditions are and the impacts that has on the health of people and on the livelihood of people there for men and fisher women. And last but not least, I'm pleased to pass the floor to Riz Dianto. He's a member of the uh, trade unions in Indonesia. He is a member of Mugawali Independent Union. And he's also a co-author of one of the publications of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation um, bat on battery production in Indonesia. And I also put the link in the chat here. So Rizdianto will now report on the local working conditions, the situation of the employees there, and 
your demands. You have the floor, Restianto. Okay, terima kasih, Manuela. Thank you so much, Manuela, for the opportunity. And thank you so much as well to Rosa Luxemburg, who is making this excellent conference that involves a number of countries. Beforehand, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Riz Bianto. I am from the Morowali Industrial Union, a member of the Confederation of the Indonesian Union. One of the questions were raised at the start of our conference, why were we involved in this discussion? We have been involved and we have also participated actively in the research that was conducted by our side in relation to the development of the battery plant in Morowali together with AEER, what has been presented by our dear friend Pius. Morowali is one of the central production of nickel in Indonesia and is one of the referrals for plants that will be the central development of electric vehicles that is based on the Jokowi or the Indonesian president administration. What I can address here at this moment is based on the situation in Morowali and the environmental impact that was mentioned by Pius and the social condition for people who are living in the mining surrounding areas. I'm talking now about the employees side, the workers. The nickel industry is one of the vital industries in the world, most especially with the government program that we have at this time the global government situation that continues to drive the campaign for the change from cars that uses fossil fuel to electric vehicles. This should be giving an impact as well to the development of the workers. We who are working in the companies owned by a Chinese company that cooperates with one of the companies in Indonesia, the company is called Xinxian, we cannot feel the welfare of the development of the industry. We don't get the direct impact. We have so many problems. What I can say the big problem is about safety, health and occupational health. And when we talk about this in our working condition, the situation is not safe. It's not safe for the workers. And the data that we have in year 2019, from January until the month of September, the number of accidents is 1,100 cases. And that is because of fatalities. People have lost their lives and just minor accidents. So the occupational health and safety is a great concern for us. When we give complaints to have a better health and safety conditions in the regions up to the district level and the government level, the government did not respond. Their answer is so normative. Yes, we'll, we're gonna deal with this, but the improvement up until this time has not been done and the standard of the quality of work is very low, very, very low. Can you imagine the people outside of the factory, they have been impacted directly because of the industry itself. But what about us who are working within the factory? We have to absorb the, and also all types of debris from nearby factories. We have four power plants that uses coal-fired power plant. And we are actually absorbing all this, but when we go back to our houses, we can feel the remains of the coals. And we cannot even try to 
dry our clothes outside because you will get the ashes that comes from the coal and the ashes itself goes into our house within our rented house everything goes inside so based on the standard of the safety itself our ppe is very low from the mask that we use our personal protective equipment we need to have a lot so that the ashes of the coal don't go directly into our lungs and of course the impact of these ashes will go directly to our lungs so on average the workers who are there they only work for seven to nine years that's the maximum that's the number of people that we have talked to it nobody would like to stay there longer than those years when they leave they get a number of diseases from lung problems lung infections etc so based on the examination of the annual health examination there are a lot of people who had hepatitis so that's a problem but up until today the changes from the company side to try and overcome the working condition that is not not being made so we think that this discussion can boost the company side to try to improve the health and occupational condition in our factory and this is also another problem food we are usually given chicken that's the food that we get mostly chicken sometimes the chicken has a lot of worms so in terms of the health itself we are not healthy meanwhile we are asked to work like 24 hours a day at the start of the pandemic during the coronavirus pandemic we had a three shift with three groups there is an off day a rest day for two days during the pandemic that working condition has changed from three shifts three groups working regularly one week full without any rest days like what we experienced in the past therefore the condition we are prone to a number of diseases and we are asked to continue to work we have criticized the situation that the three shift with three groups is not good for our health for the workers health condition but the government and the company had their excuse they say that we are in a pandemic you cannot recruit people so the company conducted a system a working condition three shift three groups and based on the law of the working condition you are actually violating this in one week you cannot have 40 hours of work we had worked with more than 40 hours a week so there is an infringement here a violation and then for our salary for our salary and wages is not like what we experience today we have to work higher in terms of the working hours to get better wage meanwhile for our friends who only work based on the working hours their wage will be just like that you can just finish it easily in one month when they receive their wages you can just finish it on that day as well to fulfill the last one month that he worked so that the accounts the savings when they don't work in the company they don't have it they don't have any savings whatsoever for housing it's not also what is happening on the field they give us two hundred thousand for housing and if you rent a room within the industrial area it's from 800,000 to 2 million rupiah. 800,000 rupiah to 2 million rupiah. So if you want to find a decent place, it's about 1 million to 2 million rupiah. They only give us 200,000. So our friends who are working, we are like, we are being forced to work. We have no choice. If we don't work, we need the work. If we work, 
well, we are working in a condition that is so dangerous, we can have accidents. And the number of unemployment in Indonesia is so big, and the government continues to voice about job creation and providing jobs to the people. But from the opportunity that we get, people don't get the same situation, especially for those who are accepted to work, especially the local people who are very limited because of their education. And it's impossible for them to compete with the workers from outside of the local areas, like the Chinese workers, for example. There are a lot of discrimination within our factory. For the Indonesian workers, the Indonesian workers, if they ask for a leave, it's so difficult. The requirements are too long, too many. The company says, there is a pandemic. We cannot accept a new employee to enter our factory. But every day we see a lot of Chinese workers coming in into Indonesia. The government said that they come to Indonesia because they are sterile from the virus of Corona. But what about us? We are asked to conduct social distancing, but it's not happening in our factory, in our working condition. This is just an excuse. The pandemic is an excuse. So actually the development of a lithium factory in Morowali should give a big impact towards the people in the surrounding areas and the workers. So we hope Rosa Luxemburg and our other friends would be able to ask our government to improve the welfare of the Indonesian workers in Indonesia, because we are aware that our struggle will not be big if it is not going to be supported from organizations from abroad. For the time being, I think this is what I can deliver at this time. We will try to develop this more in the discussion that we will conduct soon. Thank you so much, Manuela. Yeah, vielen Dank, Cristiano. Um, für dein Thank you, Cristiano, for um, this very vivid description of the working conditions which are completely um, unacceptable. And it's uh, good that we're talking about this here. And as you said, it's important to exert pressure on companies and the government.